Welcome to episode 26 of the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. This is the third episode of season two, and I'll be joined by Tony Vincent to talk about helping students retain and own classroom procedures and expectations, helping students get to know each other, classroom branding, classy graphics, shape grams, Socrative, making graphics to cut on crickets, 360 spreadsheets, and more. We'll also hear from poetic educator Tony Jackson. Let's dig in. Hi, I'm Steve Maletto from the Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast with Jake Miller. Good morning, or afternoon, or evening. (laughs) You're doing a great job on that treadmill, or driving carefully to work, or doing the thing you're doing right now. Yes, yes, welcome into the Educational Duct Tape Podcast, episode 26. I'm psyched to have Tony Vincent on the show today, plus some inspiring poetry from Tony Jackson in today's Soapbox Moment. My name, however, is not Tony, like the other two guys I'm talking about. I am Jake, and as you probably already know, I'm here to talk to you about duct tape, and educational technology, and how in my goofy mind, the two go together to form an ed tech decision making protocol that I think can help you in your classroom, school, or even an online class. Before we get to all of that, though, I'd like to review our new format for season two. Episodes come out every other Wednesday morning, and on the other Wednesdays, we have the hashtag EDU duct tape Twitter chat. Last week, we had the first ever chat, and it was amazing. I was so touched to have that many people join uh, in for a chat based off of my little podcast and and the things that they shared. Oh, man, It, it truly proved my hunch that the audience of this show had their own awesome answers to the questions my guests and I discuss on the show. I'm going to link into the show notes a blog post that includes some of my favorite tweets from the chat. If you missed the chat, ch- check that list out and, and see what you missed. You'll, you'll learn plenty from it, and you'll probably be inspired to participate next week. If you were part of the chat, check it out to see what tweets of yours are in there, because they probably are, because y'all have just like amazing ideas. It, it was so... It's, wow. What, what an amazing group of educators we have uh, in this little community of duct tapers. So next Wednesday, September 11th of 2019 at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'll chat about four questions from today's episode. The first will be from the game that I play with Tony today. The second will be from the soapbox moment today, which I am so excited about, by the way. And the third and fourth questions will be the two questions that Tony and I discuss in this very episode. I I hope you'll join us. I've also linked into the show notes a Google Calendar that'll show you all of the upcoming chat dates and episode release dates. You can click on it and add it to your calendar. Still hoping, by the way, that someone will help me make that Microsoft-y friendly for those of you who aren't Googlers. So if you know how to help me out and make a calendar that'll help other ed tech people who aren't in the Google crowd using Google Calendar, hit me up, jakemillertech at gmail.com. I've also got a few links with tips for Twitter chats in there for you. Check them out if you're a Twitter chat newbie. If you are, it's not as scary as it seems. Maybe even just search for hashtag edu duct tape next Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and just watch it all happen. You'll figure it out very quickly. But better yet, check out the links in the show notes, figure out how to do it yourself and participate. Just remember when you're doing it, you don't have to read everything. You don't have to respond to everything because they'll be there afterwards if you want to go back and look at them. Or, heck, even if you only see a quarter of the tweets, that much learning is more than a lot of other educators are doing, and you should be proud that you're doing that much. You don't have to do it all. It'd be wonderful if you did, but you don't have to. A reminder, by the way, that you can listen without chatting, and you can also chat without listening. That would be weird because you're listening right now, but the point is don't feel like you have to do them both or even do them in order. We'll welcome you as you are, when you can participate, and we'll understand when you can't participate or listen. Judgment-free zone here, guys. Speaking of which, some people actually respond to the chat questions the next day, and that's 100% fine, too. We, we saw them. 
right? And and a lot of them got responses and likes and retweets, stuff like that. If you can't stay up until 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, then respond to the questions the next day. Totally fine. Or look at the posts that I make, like, like I mentioned the post from last week's with some of my curated favorite tweets, and you can go back and respond to some of them there too. Um, or just, again, search for hashtag edu duct tape, go to the latest tweets, and you'll be able to see them all as they happened. By the way, Speaking of all this stuff, the the post that goes with it, the uh, the chat, responding to people in the chat, the interviews that make up this podcast, the soapbox moments. Hey, keep it down over there. I'm making a podcast. It's not time. It's not time for that now. Anyhow, between the interviews, the soapbox moments, the the Twitter chats, the blog posts, the the blog posts about the chats, the stickers, the tweets, and and all of the other things, I could really use a little help. If you, if you're a dedicated every episode listener and would be interested in helping me out, like, listen, I know you're educators and you're busy, but if you feel like you're an educator who has a few extra minutes a week to spare to help me out. Send me an email at jakemillertech at gmail.com. If, if you don't send me an email about this, I will not be offended. I'm not like, I don't have like a list of all the listeners out there. And I'm checking off who emails me and who doesn't. Like, no, I know, now I know who really likes me. <laughs> I know you're busy and some of you are parents and, and you got all kinds of other things and some of you have jobs on the side to, to help you to stay afloat. Like, it's okay. But, it, but if you'd like to help out, send me an email. I, I feel like I need like a street team, a, a group of duct tapers who can help me out when they have some time to spare. So if you'd like to be part of this duct taper army, and that, no, I don't like, I don't like the sound of that. This this quack pack. <laughs> No, I don't know about that. Uh, anyhow, we'll, we'll figure out a name. I, I don't have anything to pay you. Maybe I can loan you the soapbox for a birthday party? Oh, okay, he doesn't like that idea. Uh, maybe you could borrow the high horse for your next black tie event? I, I, I don't know. But I could certainly give you some stickers or something. Anyhow, if, if you're up for it, send me an email, and I'll share with you some of the help that I'm looking for. Again, jakemillertech at gmail. Dot com. Before I step up on that noisy soapbox over there, let's check in on my calendar. In October, I'll be at Tecumseh Local Schools and Twinsburg Schools here in Ohio, the Quincy Conference in Illinois, and at TCCA in Texas. TCCA, by the way, is the largest free ed tech conference in Texas. How, how cool is that? Anyhow, back to the calendar. In November, I'll be keynoting the My Google Conference in Michigan, doing a mini keynote at the WVIZ Idea Stream Technology and Learning Conference in Cleveland and speaking at the Teach Better conference uh, down the road from me in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. That's actually all for 2019, so if you need a speaker, trainer, presenter, or consultant, hit me up at jakemillertech at gmail.com. What about some web-related events? Well, back in June, I was a guest on the Sons of Technology podcast. If, if you don't listen to that show, you really should. But I, I was a guest as we were ramping up to ISTE. It was like the week before ISTE. Obviously, ISTE 19 is in our rear view, but it was still a fun conversation. Uh, you should check it out. As always, the link to that appearance is in the show notes. You know what? Ho- hold on. Cut the music. You and I need to talk, Soapbox. What? What is... What's up with this thing? Last last week during the Twitter chat, I see that you've got you've got a Twitter account now. What? You you don't even have hands. How can you be tweeting? Uh, yeah, don't think I didn't see you in there taking part in the chat. Yeah, I know some of the people were excited, but you didn't even tell me in advance that you knew how to tweet. I didn't ask. Why, why would I ask a soapbox if it tweets? <sighs> All right. Well, I, I, I guess. I, I guess I'll just let you do your thing. Now he seems excited about that, I guess. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Let me just grab my soapbox from over here. There we go. That's yeah, perfect. Climb up on there. So you have probably already realized I love education, I love teaching, and I love Twitter. And I saw a tweet on Twitter about teaching and education back in July that I have probably looked at no lie, 20 different times. It's by this guy, Tony Jackson. I started following Tony after he spoke at the Flipgrid Live event at ISTE. Eight or nine different people took the stage for about 30 seconds each to speak about their why. They were all really good, and I immediately started following any of them that I didn't previously follow on Twitter. But Tony was different. Tony slayed the mic. You see, Tony is a poet and teacher. And from what I can tell, he's really good at both. So anyhow, I started following him, and Tony, Tony, if you're listening, this is crazy because I'll always remember the details of this. 
I, I was on vacation with my family, and we were supposed to be out playing mini golf, but there was a storm rolling in, so we had to stay home. The clouds were coming, and the wind was picking up, but it felt like fantastic, this fresh like ocean air on this breeze. So while my kids played foosball inside, I sat out on the balcony looking at Twitter, and I came across this tweet from Tony where he shared this talk that he did. The whole thing is dynamite, but there was this one particular set of lines that just... It, it just... I don't, I don't know. It just like grabbed on to me. It, you know what? You've just got to hear it. Here, here it is. I am not the best teacher in the world. And I won't claim to be something that I've never been. But I can say with absolute certainty that every year I am the best teacher that I've ever been. I have never been more certain. I see what doesn't work and put the work in to get it working. I'm not perfect, but still it's worth it to change what's beyond the surface. But what if I never changed? But what if I never changed? Oh, man, that part just gets me. You'll have to watch the video. The the link is in the show notes to hear the rest of it. You'll also have to subscribe to this podcast to make sure you hear the episode a few months from now when Tony is a guest on the show, which I could not be more psyched about to hear his knowledge about educational technology. The reason that I wanted to share this with you, though, is because this embodies the mindset that I try to communicate to educators. No one expects you to be the best teacher in the world. No one is asking you to be perfect. All that you could do is to be the best teacher you've ever been. Yes, this is what educational duct tape is all about, right? We don't use the technology just to use the technology. We don't use it because we hear our administrator talking about it, or because the teacher down the hall is using it, or because we see people tweeting about it. We use it because it's helping us meet a goal or solve a problem in our classroom. As Tony says, I see what doesn't work and put the work in to get it working. (sighs) I often repeat Dr. Maya Angelou's quote, do the best you can until you know better, and then when you know better, do better. And I want educators to hear that you don't have to use the same amount of technology as I use, or as your school's all-star teacher uses, or as Tony Vincent in today's episode used in his class last year. All that matters is that when you know better, you do better. That's the only thing that's inexcusable. You don't have to do it all. You just have to move forward. So as Tony Jackson asked in this excerpt from his talk, but what if I never changed? Later in the talk, Tony says, Being the change takes practice, not the kind that you do until it's perfect, the kind that you do because it's worth it. And that thought continues with some words that, if I read them aloud, you'd probably hear tears in my voice. But I'm not going to leave them out because I'm scared for you to hear that. I'm going to leave them out because I want you to hear them from Tony. The link to the video is in the show notes. You should go watch it. And I think that you'll agree after you do, it's a fantastic message to hear early in the school year. Let's identify a few things that we could do better for our students, and let's make it happen. Not to be perfect, but because it's worth it. Thanks, Tony, for letting me use your words here. I'm excited to have you on the show soon. And now, it's time for a different Tony. Let's welcome in our guest. Today's guest. All right, today our guest is Tony Vincent. Tony has been an educator for 20 years. He started out teaching fifth grade and then was a tech coach. He left school teaching to be a self-employed consultant on a mission to empower teachers and students with awesomeness. He went back to teaching fifth grade for the 2018-19 school year, but most importantly, Tony is the father of first grade twins. You can find all of Tony's content on learninginhand.com or on Instagram at learninginhand or on Twitter at Tony Vincent. Tony, welcome in. Thanks for being here today. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, totally. So so Tony and I met in person over the summer, which I was so psyched about. Yeah. yeah so I, I've been following you on Twitter, Tony, for, I don't know, like, 35 years. How long has Twitter been around? I'm not even sure. <laughs> but I, I've been loving seeing your your content, your graphics and your videos that you post on Twitter. You're like a, I don't know, graphical representation of information like rock star. Like it's just so simple and to the point and visually appealing. Uh, but then meeting you, I was able to see you speak. And I was like, man, this guy's a, a good speaker. And he, he gets he gets the classroom stuff too. Like I got to have him on the show. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And and it was great to meet you too. You you are you are taller than uh, than you sound. <laughs> Yeah. Do I sound short? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't say you said a short. You were just taller than you sound. Okay. All right. <laughs> you know, somebody told me at ISTE that they, they think maybe I'm taking the soapbox that I talk about in the show around and standing on it, but really I'm not. I just... Yeah, man. You get on that soapbox, you're really super tall. 
<laughs> right. I like that's why it sounds kind of echoey because I'm like at the ceiling while I'm recording from there. <laughs> so so after we met over the summer, that was at the uh, Sci Fair uh, Independent School District uh, Digital Learning Convention. I think I heard from two different people, uh, my friend Manny and my friend Les. Like you've got to have Tony on the show, and I was like, duh, <laughs> of course I want to have Tony on the show. <laughs> I think one of them, I can't remember which one it was, like almost started like a little bit of a campaign to make it happen. You remember that? Yeah, I saw I saw some <laughs> tweets. So it's, it's happening. It's happening. It's, it's all <laughs> coming full circle. It's real. Um, Unless your dreams are coming true. Yeah. So speaking of tweets, though, you just tweeted a couple days ago something that that I had kind of heard about in a different format a couple months back. So Jen Giffen was on the show in season one. She was awesome. She she and I had so much to talk about that it became two episodes instead of one. <laughs> um, but one of the things that Jen and I were talking about was uh, visual design and students making graphics uh, to show their thinking about things in class. And she, at the same time that we were recording that, was in your classy graphics course. And she was geeking out about how much she enjoyed it and how much she learned from it. But she said her favorite thing was the Shapegrams that you had them do. And now Shapegrams is its own thing, right? It is, yeah. It, this started back in uh, the summer of 2017 when I first started uh, doing classy graphics. I wanted some way for the adults in the class to get some drawing skills, to be able to yeah. you know, draw shapes, uh, order them, uh, change their attributes, and make pictures with them. So mm -hmm. every week I had some of these pictures for them to recreate, and they got harder over time. Well, then when I went back into the classroom this last year, uh, I used Shapegrams every week in my classroom. It was every okay. Wednesday. I had a new one for students and I started out easy. And then by the end of the year, man, my kids were doing amazing stuff. But Wednesdays were like our favorite days because I used it as morning bell work. Mm -hmm. So my fifth graders come in, they get their Chromebooks, they check their morning message on Google Classroom. And then they have the link to make their copy of the Shapegram. Mm -hmm. And Shapegrams are a series of Google Drawings documents. And I have some design tips on one side and then the picture and space to recreate it on the main canvas. And then like an extension activity if they got done early or oh. maybe drawing a picture of something intrigues them that they can then go off and explore something or use an online interactive or read an article or, or something that has to do with the picture. Right. So I had really been wanting to offer these to others. It's, I used it with my fifth graders and my fifth grade colleagues at my school used them. And we, we all just really noted what students could do when they had these skills. Mm -hmm. And my students, they were making their own clip art. Um, when it was time for a project, you know, they, they would make their own everything like from scratch. If we had to do, especially with, with animated GIFs, because uh, they could control every part of it and make it in Google Slides and do a slide by slide uh, animation that they could draw people and they could move the arms around. They could change the colors because it was all creations that they had made. Right. I could ask them, you know, okay, uh, let's make a diagram of the rock cycle. Mm -hmm. Boom. They could like from scratch, make, right? Like amazing things. And then they've made, they made uh, things that we designed with to become stickers and bookmarks and pamphlets. It was, <laughs> it was a highlight of our school year for sure. I bet. I so can tell. I was, I was really excited that, um, you know, so I had these ideas. Now I have a complete school year set. I have like over 35 of these that uh, now I, I'm going back and I have time to record a short little video so that other teachers can use them. And even if they don't have, you know, some of the design experience, uh, they can watch my my little video. They're, well, they're about two, two to four minutes long, where uh, I kind of introduce a few things about the picture. And then just slowly over the, the course of the year, because I'll release one of these a week, uh, students can learn keyboard shortcuts. They can learn kind of drawing tricks and all sorts of things that they can become super awesome with Google Drawings, Google Slides, and really transfer to just about any kind of drawing program 
what they learn with shapegrams. Right, because those like those keyboard shortcuts and those functions and those tools inside of drawings might be totally different from what they use in 10 years, but the principles of design that they're using and the way of thinking about making graphics, that doesn't go away, right? That's going to stay with them. Yeah, it, it's one of my favorite books is Math Curse, where okay. this girl, yeah, I know that one, yep. uh, the, te- <laughs> the, the teacher says, you know, everything could be a math problem if you thought about it, and then everything she sees is a math problem. Right. Uh, I feel like I have shape grams curse because anything yeah. I look at, I'm like, ooh, I can see the shapes. I would make that out of. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, and I can see the kids doing that as well. My my kids, all, all three of them are are builders. They, they love building and creating. My daughter's a crafter and my sons love building and making things. So I could see them totally geeking out about about doing these drawings. And the, the thing that's that's part of what I really love about this, Tony, is that so you're, we always talk about how tech should be like integrated into the learning experience, right? And you're, you're talking about doing it here kind of separately, so that then when you get to the learning experience, the use of the tool is, is it's like a nature, like they already know how to do it, right? Um, but be even, you know, because you're doing it beforehand as a separate thing, separate from the regular classroom learning, it's something that kids really enjoy. So it doesn't matter, right? It just becomes this fun part of the day that you're all enjoying. And then when you get to, like you said, the rock cycle, like they've already got those skills to express themselves with. Yeah, exactly. And what I like is, I mean, for me, it was a lot of prep. But now Mm -hmm. what I'm presenting to teachers is like, you just distribute the link to students, let them make their copies. Right. And then the next half hour, like they're engaged in something worthwhile. They're doing some problem solving. They're doing some learning and, and, and that frees the teacher up to meet with small groups yeah. or, you know, like these things are great for station rotations. Yeah. Um, it's just because it's, it, I try to try to package it all up to make it so super friendly for teachers and students because, uh, after a year back in the classroom, I am a big fan of things that I can just, <laughs> that I can trust that I can give to my students and I know they'll like it and I know they'll learn and I know they'll be worthwhile. And yeah, and then you could focus on those small groups, like you were saying. I can remember, so I, I, I've been in education now for uh, 16, 17 years. And I can remember when I first came out, things like stations weren't talked about a lot. It's not that they weren't around yet. They just weren't the the big thing to do, especially out of elementary school. And then I can remember when I first heard about stuff like that and about conferencing with kids, I was like, but what are the kids doing while I'm doing that? And something like Shapegrams is kind of like the gold standard because it's valuable for the kids. It's not just busy work, but it en- engages them in such a way that they're perfectly behaved and learning and enjoying this time while you're doing these other things that you're doing on the side. Like like you said, you trust it, right? You can just trust that this is going to work. The kids are going to be busy and I'm going to get to do this other stuff that that benefits the other kids more deeply than you know, if we weren't doing these small group things. Exactly. Yeah. And the other thing I like about this too. So for the people out there listening that are like, yeah, Tony, that sounds wonderful, but I teach, I don't know, 12th grade government. Like, what am I going to do with this or something like that? First of all, we could probably find a a way they would use it. But second of all, I recommend going and looking at the site. So it's shapegrams.com shape as in shape grams as in like, uh, Instagrams, uh, dot com. Yeah. Why don't I just say the metric measurement grams? Why did I go to Instagrams there? <laughs> that, was the most, that was the most 2019 way to yeah, explain something yeah. ever. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, go to the website. And what I really like is there's you have some pictures of the activities on there. And they're, they're, it's all in drawings. And you've essentially made hyperdocs that are in drawings, right? Yeah, everything is housed and packaged right inside that Google Drawings document. And I take advantage of yeah. the, the left and right and actually top and bottom of the canvas right. too, so that right. there's extra stuff all around. Yeah, you've got to kind of zoom out and then you can see there's a video off on the left, and there's instructions on the right, and there's tips here and stuff like that. To And then the kids are using that inside space, the center, to make their own thing. But then I, I think people just need to go look at it to understand it because it really is a very cool resource how you've instructionally designed it. So so like I said, that eighth grade uh a government teacher can go look and see just just a way that they could potentially design a blended learning activity, even though they might not want to teach the kids how to do Google drawings, which maybe they should anyhow. But regardless, it's a really well designed thing. Yeah, so kudos to you. Oh, on thanks. That. And I, I think like probably third grade to to seventh grade is probably the target audience for this. But um, mm-hmm. there's going to be one a week and the first three are free. So teachers can try out and see if this is the kind of content that that would be good for them. Um, and then, uh, after that, I've priced it at $35 for the year. So then you get all the rest, a total of 35. So I, 
Um, yeah. Thinking, you know, I would have gladly paid somebody a dollar <laughs> for each one right, of these right. and for the for the half hour of time that I got in the classroom and uh, for the learning that, that occurred. Right. And I can just imagine the time you're putting into it between preparing the drawings, preparing the instructions, recording the videos, putting them in there, sending them out like you certainly deserve to get some payment for that. So a dollar per activity is uh, that's very, very fair, very, very good price. And like you said, I would gladly pay a dollar to have, have the kids learning something deeply that in, enables me to be able to work with other students in the class. And that's so awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. And cool. one last piece of trivia about it. When you go to shapegrams.com, uh, the logo is drawn completely in Google Drawing. So it's all made out of oh, Google Drawing I was Drawing wondering shapes. about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th- everybody, when they when they go see it, you'll see that the, they're all, you know, poly polygon shapes that make up the logo to shape grams. And I was wondering, I said, I wonder, did he make this in Google Drawings itself? And uh, I'm not surprised to hear you <laughs> did. It's very cool, though, how you got the curved edges and things like that in there. Um, so I'm guessing that people are going to look at the logo and be like, all right, I've, I've got to know how to do this. So now I'm going to do shape grams, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I, I package it for students, but I know a lot of teachers have said, I want to learn these skills. So um, Mm -hmm. even if you're a teacher not using them with kids, you can learn week by week with me, uh, these drawing skills. Super cool, Tony. Very good. Very cool stuff. So now that we've kind of already geeked out about some educational <laughs> technology stuff, we got, we got ahead of ourselves. We got to right. play a game. We're, right. I don't like it's like we're new season and I forgot the rules to my own show. We can't talk about the ed tech until we play a game. Two truths and one lie. So we're going to play uh, two truths and one lie. You're going to give me three statements. I am going to try to figure out the lie. I am going to either A, do poorly and not figure out what the lie is, because that, that's what tends to happen. Or I'll not figure out what the lie is and then forget to ask you which one the lie <laughs> was, because that happens sometimes All right. too. I'm really bad at my own game, but go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, uh, well, the first thing is I am afraid of frogs. Okay. Uh, I take a nap every day. Okay. And I prefer white birthday cake over chocolate. Hmm. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I So I, the, the frogs thing sounds a little crazy to me, <laughs> but it seems like where would Tony have come up with that if it's not true, right? How did he think of like, what could I yeah, be scared yeah. of that Jake wouldn't believe? Frogs. Like, what would a frog do to you? I don't know. Um, the napping, I, I know you have... Uh, first grade twins. So I'm, I'm guessing there's not a lot of nap time available in your day. Um, and white cake doesn't sound that crazy to me. I, 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 I know people who like the white cake better than the chocolate cake. So I'm going to think, I, I think, oh my gosh, is it the frogs or the nap? Mm, I think it's the, I think the frogs is a lie. I don't think you're f- afraid of frogs. I think you're afraid of something maybe with teeth that might actually be scary. <laughs> <laughs> so am I right? Is it frogs? You are not right. No, I am. I am afraid of frogs. Like I think they're going to jump at me. I I steer clear away <laughs> from frogs. They're slimy. <laughs> Ugh, yuck. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Jump at you and do what? I don't like, then I'd feel their slime on my skin. No way. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking earlier about, about Jen Giffen uh, talking about the classic graphics course. When she was on, she said her fear is balloons. <laughs> But well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which is worse, being afraid of balloons or being afraid of frogs. Yeah, like, yeah, I guess balloons I could pop at any moment, so I get it. I Could you imagine? <laughs> what if the balloons were filled with frogs? That oh, would be Zeus. terrifying, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> or a frog-shaped balloon. That wouldn't be that scary, but scared of balloons. Well, I'm impressed with your ability to get naps in during the day. How do you pull that off? Uh, oh, the kid, the kids are doing shape grams, aren't they? Yeah. No, the nap is not great. No, what's the lie? See, I'm always messing up my game. <laughs> You're not, you are afraid of frogs. So which one's a lie, the nap or the cake? The lie is the nap. I would love to take a nap every day, but I try to force myself not to so I can get more done. Right. I hear you. You got power through. Yeah. Power through. <laughs> That's what it's called. Wouldn't it be nice though? Yeah. Well, in my first grade twins, we, we, they just went back to school, but pretty much every day over the summer, they took an hour and a half nap. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. My kids, I, I, my kids all stop napping at young ages. Like 
two or three years old, they were like, nope, done. And we'd spend like an hour battling them to take a nap and never get the nap done. And then we were all just exhausted from the fight, yeah. not the nap. And and we're like, why did we even try? Let's just stop. So so I, I'm I'm happy for you that you made it all summer with naps. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of surprised that it that it lasted this long. And and then on weekends, even when they're in kindergarten, week weekend naps. That's when some of my naps would take place. Then that's the dream. That's the dream. You were living the dream, Tony. <laughs> Nice. Okay, so let's get into the educational duct tape now. And for those of you out there that might be new listeners, a little background on what educational duct tape is. It's my weird metaphor that educational technology is at its most useful when it's a tool like duct tape being used to help us solve a problem or meet a goal, address a learning standard, achieve something we want to achieve in our classroom, rather than being the focus where the focus is not on the tool, the focus is on solving whatever classroom pedagogical or relationship problem, whatever you have in your classroom that you're trying to achieve, the technology is the tool for it. Just like duct tape, we don't go out there trying to use duct tape. We go out there trying to handle whatever problems we need to solve. And duct tape often is a really handy tool for that. So are you ready for your first question, Tony? I'm ready. Throw it at me. Okay. And so this, this is a special one that somebody uh, suggested on a poll that I put out over the summer. I said, what, what kind of back to school topics do you want to hear about? And somebody said, how can you communicate classroom routines and expectation so students grasp key concepts, but also are active participants in the process? So you're trying to communicate those important things you need to tell them at the beginning of the year, but you want the students to be active participants and grasp those concepts. How, how could you use technology to help you with that? Yeah, well, this is what I did teaching fifth grade this last year is I was on a quest to give students as much ownership as possible. Mm-hmm. And that meant really like by fifth grade, they have been in a classroom quite a bit. They know what routines and expectations, the, the rules of a classroom should be. So I called the kids up to the carpet. I had a Google Doc open on my computer, shining up on the screen, and we just did a huge brain dump. We brainstormed everything that that we could possibly want for a, a rule in the classroom, you know, or s- s- an expectation, something to be mindful of, like, you know, respectful voices, enter and exit quietly, uh, follow the restroom procedures, be respectful to supplies and on and on all these things. Like we just, we filled up, uh, I think four pages of a Google doc, large font, but four mm-hmm. pages with this stuff. Then uh, I took each one of those and I pasted them into a shape in a Google drawings document. So each, of course, <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I put them off to the left and right sides of it. They're just kind of all randomized. Okay. And uh, I gave students, uh, they were, they were in groups of three and one student made a copy of the document. So all three go around one computer so they can talk, but, mm-hmm. and then their job was to sort everything, bring those shapes in onto the Google canvas, Google drawings, canvas, and um, figure out what goes together because having 50 some rules, that's silly. We wanted to get, um, we call essential agreements. We wanted to get between hmm, four and eight would probably be a good number. So we had to condense these into ideas, categories. Mm -hmm. And it was really fun to see. So the groups are working and they're moving around and they're having discussions about each one of these. Like, does restroom procedures, does that go with entering and exiting the room quietly? Or is Mm -hmm. that, are those two different things that they should be in different categories? Right. So they, uh, they, um, then once they had kind of everything sorted and, and clumped into these groups, then they brought in a text box and they labeled what what they were getting at with that group, what they had in common, what that essential agreement might be. Right. And so what was nice about this is that the groups came together at, at, in the end when we were looking at the different documents and they were all so similar because, well, that's kind of the way a classroom runs. Right. So we came up with... Uh, what are it, like seven of them? And mm-hmm. they ended up being respect everyone's right to learn, be mindful of distractions, be kind, always do your best, follow procedures, be ready, focused, and sitting properly. <laughs> that one we called out on its own because uh, just in the first couple days of school, we already had way too many problems <laughs> with 
people falling off their chairs because they're not sitting properly. Oh, goodness. And uh, <laughs> our final one was try new things and have an open mind. Oh, I love that one. So, so we all signed off on these agreements. And then for me, it's, it's been a year now since I got my, my favorite uh, technology uh, from the last year. I got okay. my Cricut cutting device. Nice, so yes. In I brought each of those essential agreements into an app on my iPhone called Typorama. Okay. There's also like on Android, I think, uh, Word Swag or Text Swag. I forget what it's mm-hmm. called there. But uh, so you type it in and then you just kind of go through and it will just, you just keep pressing until you'd like a design. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it kind of makes some fancy different fonts. And I did that for each one and then put it into my Cricut and cut them out on vinyl and put them on the wall so that we have this beautiful display of these essential agreements that we all came up with. Um, those same graphics oh. I put on our website and then they would be on I had a, a, a TV in the classroom that we just used as a digital bulletin board. So they were there on rotation. And, nice. you know, these these are very important phrases to us. And yeah, uh, if somebody broke one of those essential agreements, I would, you know, kind of walk over and just kind of touch it, <laughs> point <laughs> at it. <laughs> and they already knew. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I need to do better. Yeah. Um, and then it, it rarely came down to this, but I did have like a, like, it was like a pink form that had all seven of these on there and the student would circle which one. Oh, I uh, love they, it. They had a problem with and their plan for going forward in the future to make sure they can follow that agreement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love but, that you're focusing back, like when something does go wrong, that you're, you're relating back to those rules. So those rules aren't like one and done at the beginning of the year and you never talk about them again. You've successfully given the kids ownership of it. You've kind of put it like done kind of like a branding thing with it where it, where you see it everywhere. Right. And yep. then when something happens with it, we, we go back to those exact rules and we talk about the certain rules that they were breaking or the, or the categories of the rules, those essential agreements is what you call it, which I like that. Yeah. And yeah, so the students had buy-in because they came up with it mm-hmm. and at our school, students are used to doing this every year. Um, my school is an IB school, an international uh, baccalaureate okay. school. And this is part of the program is coming up with essential agreements. So even like my first grade twins came home from the first day of school yesterday and they're like, Oh yeah, we're working on our essential agreements. So it's something they, they They've done every year, probably not with the help of Google drawings or <laughs> with uh, typorama making them look cool, but yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're always student generated um, with help from the teacher and posted somewhere in the room. Yeah. I love that. And I, I like that you use those, you know, kind of stuck with the building format, but it's really just a good practice for the kids to be a part of that process. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, previous to that, when I taught fifth grade back in the late 90s and early 2000s, I had this framed uh, and we just had one rule and it was framed at the front of the room and it was everyone has the right to learn. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. while that's kind of one of our essential agreements, like everything kind of sprung from that. And we had conversations right. like your own right to learn, others right to learn, and everything kind of did did come from there. But yeah. I came up with that. So uh, I like the essential agreements where it, again, gives the class more ownership. Yeah, I love the idea of doing it in drawings and having them sort it there. And then I, I did not know that you could do stuff from like Word Swag or Typerama or anything like that. And then and then vinyl cut it. So you can you download those files, you download them as an image, and then you convert it somewhere? How did that part work? Yeah, so you can bring in a PNG file. So uh, Typorama saves as a PNG with a transparent background. You bring that into the Cricut Design Space software mm-hmm. and then size it the way you want and send it through the Cricut. Neat, neat. And so for, for educators that maybe don't have a Cricut, they, they might have a vinyl cutter in their school, which w- could do the same thing, just slightly different software and things like that. Um, but also if you don't have either of those options, you know, there's no reason we can't just print them and, you know, and, and hang them up on paper. Certainly it looks cooler if it's, if it's the vinyl, like you were talking about, but anything where they're bringing that stuff and reminding the kids, these are the things that you agreed on, right? Yeah. Or it could be even, I really got in the school year having tabletop. So like table Mm. tents. So you could make it where you have a few on each side of this trifold thing Mm -hmm. that you staple or glue and set up in the middle of each table. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's right there for students too. however you decide to display them. But it's important for them to be an eyesight of students so that they can always take a look at them and 
And the teacher can always point them out yeah. when he or she needs to. Yeah, I like that. So so the way I thought of it was actually kind of similar to the way you thought of it, except for I, I didn't think of the using the drawings thing, which I love. But I was thinking that of, along the same idea of generate class ideas for what we might include in this document and then give the students a way to kind of pick what they what they think are the best ones and what which ones they think belong and maybe have them craft the agreements because really when you when you look back at this question um it, it's kind of an oxymoron in a way you're, you're saying how, how can how can you as the teacher communicate these things and then have the students be active participants. Like you, you can't communicate it and have them be active participants. It's, all, it's almost got to go the other order, right? They've got to be active participants in designing them and then you can communicate them. So maybe, maybe oxymoron is not the right term. It's just kind of out of order. But, you know, I, I, I thought of the first tool that came to mind for me was a tool called Socrative. Have you ever used Socrative before? I have, yes. Yeah, so Socrative was was kind of the formative assessment tool maybe like, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. Like it, it was the the one you heard talked about the most, or at least I heard talked about the most. It, it's still out there, but doesn't get as much love nowadays because tools like Kahoot and Quizzes and Gimkit and all of these different formative assessment tools, which are all wonderful, have kind of taken the focus away from Socrative. But <laughs> I will tell you what, though, I've used Socrative more than any of the other ones just because it was like dead simple to use. And I yeah. didn't have to figure out like all these stuff. Like, I don't want a game. I just I just, I just want something simple. And I know Socrative yeah. provides that. <laughs> Yeah. And that's the way that's the way I, I like to think about these formative assessment tools, too, is there's not like one right formative assessment tool to use. Like if somebody's still using Socrative or something they used 10 years ago or whatever they might use, as as long as the, the only reason you should be changing tools is if it better meets the goals that you have for your classroom or if it meets additional goals, like you don't have to change just because something's newer. So if Socrative is still meeting your needs, then there's no reason to switch to these other ones unless they're giving you something that addresses another need. But the thing that jumps off the page to me about Socrative here, my very favorite feature about Socrative is that you can ask your class a question, a short answer question, and then after they've all responded, you can then open back up their responses for a vote. And I, I think what Socrative probably thought of using this for was like, who has the best answer? But in this situation, if every student suggests a rule or multiple rules, then you could kind of turn those back around to the students and have them vote on which ones they think belong. And then you as the teacher will get some numbers. Oh, 15 people thought this rule should be a classroom rule. Only two people thought this one should be. So it's a way to to get them involved in that process. Now, it doesn't allow them to do the sorting you're talking about, which I love, but it does kind of allow them to vote on the different things in there. On the topic of Socrative, while, while we're talking about it, it is a freemium app for people who maybe have never heard of it or never used it. But I really think the free is, is good enough. Like it has the features uh, that most teachers will need in the free. You know, if, if it becomes something you're using regularly, then you might want to look at the paid ones. But but I love the freemium app Socrative. And like you said, I, I still continue to use it because you don't have to just change just to change, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I've also have never needed to go to the pro version. It, it's for free. It's done everything I've needed. Right. And I think the pro version, like one of the one of the big things with the pro version is the ability to have larger classes, the ability to have multiple questions running at, at the same time and things like that. So especially for a, a fifth grade teacher like yourself, uh, with one or two classrooms and relatively small groups of students, it's going to be sufficient. But if it becomes something that you're using regularly, hey, why not? Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but but lots of lots of good ideas there for for generating student ideas. But again, the important part is, the students need to be active participants, no matter how well you communicate the rules to them. If if they don't see themselves having a voice in how they were determined, they're really not going to own those things, and they're really not going to respond well to them. And I, and that's I, I I don't consider myself to be an educational expert, so maybe I'm not qualified to talk about whether or not you should be discussing routines and things like that, and what the best way to determine them is. But I know. From my perspective as an educator, my belief is something like both of us are talking about here where the students have a voice in deciding what these things are because, because they're saying, these are the rules we think we should abide by. These are the, the procedures we think we should have in the classroom, things like that. I love that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it, I always call it our classroom. So we right. own it collectively. That means we should collectively have the responsibility for deciding how it runs. Yeah, gosh, I can remember saying things as a young teacher like, 
when you're in my classroom, the expectation is this. And what a, hor- what a horrible thing to say. It, it is it is a great, <laughs> great uh, language switch to, to switch over to saying our yeah. classroom. I love that. So I, st- I still do enjoy sometimes saying, well, when you're a teacher, then you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> that just, that, those are one of those sayings, like, because I said so, where you know, like, this might not be the best yeah. thing to say, but it's just so damn fun to say it. <laughs> but yeah, I just. <laughs> and I just said, damn, in a podcast. Oh, man, I just lost some listeners right there. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> okay, so before before I say any real like real uh, x xed out swear words, maybe you should ask your question and get us off this topic. <laughs> oh yes, yes. So my question is, how can we help our students get to know their new classmates? So one one idea that I've seen going around out there are you know when I what I one thing I used to do, which I still love, and I know one of my my kiddos who's in elementary school came back and said they did this in their class is you have these papers where. You know, it lists a whole bunch of things like went camping this summer, went to a basketball camp this summer, um, read 10 books this summer, whatever, a bunch of different statements that help you get to know each other. And they go around and introduce themselves to their classmates and have them sign on the line. And, and I think that is a good icebreaker activity. You certainly have to be careful about the kinds of things you're putting in there because some students could feel bad that they didn't do a lot of those things. So you've got to be careful about what you're including. Uh, but one thing that I've seen on Twitter people doing is instead of just doing that, they actually make it a selfie activity where to learn how to use your Chromebook or whatever device you have in the classroom, not only do you find that person, but you take a selfie with them. And then you're kind of uh, practicing a tech skill while you're also getting to know your students. And what kid doesn't love taking selfies? I mean, that's one of their favorite things to do right there. Ah, I love that. And then they can check out that selfie at the end of the school year. Right. Remember that? Remember that at the beginning of the school year? We barely knew each other. Right. And now we're best buds or now we hate each other. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. your te- that's what great now we're teaching. frenemies. <laughs> <laughs> we're frenemies, right? So, what what would you do? How would you help students get to know their classmates? Well, here's what I did last year, and uh, that was, you know, I'm my my favorite app ever. If I could just have one, okay. is Google Slides. So, I thought well, I'm going to use Google Slides first day of school, and that's what we did. Um, I shared a slide. Actually, I created a slide before their very eyes about me. Oh, I love that idea of doing it. And I kept it pretty open-ended. I know there are templates you could use, but I, I just said, here's a blank slide. And then the first thing I showed them, because I wanted to wow them, and I wanted them to be really excited, because they've, they've had Chromebooks since, uh, one-to-one Chromebooks since they were in second okay. grade. So they're, you know, I they, they knew slides pretty well. So I took a side profile mm-hmm. picture with the camera, and then I showed them the curve line tool, where the curve line tool, you can kind of trace. And you, every time you click, it kind of curves to the next mm-hmm. part, connects the dots. So we, we trace all around our heads. It takes several times. Like, I'm awesome at it. So when they try it, and there's not, <laughs> they're not so awesome yeah. yet, uh, they, they have to try a few times. But then they delete the background Love. picture, the, the picture they took, just leaving their yeah. silhouette. And then I show them how to how to give that a color fill and an outline and maybe even a thicker outline. Maybe they can make it glow. And uh, so that's their picture. Then I show them word art and they put their name like in you know, with, with colors and, and a styling that kind of reflects their personality. And then they bring in pictures of things they like that's special to them. And so then they they all made the, these slides, and then it, it took us a couple days to go through them because mm-hmm. having like twenty seven kids each getting them even just one minute to talk about their slide is a long time. So right. over the co- course of a couple of days, we'd pull the slides up, and the kids would tell us what why they put what they did on their slide. And these slides were on a rotating slideshow on our class uh, display TV. Oh, cool! And what I loved about this is that I got to know them. They got to know each other. They got really excited about designing with Google slides, which set the tone for our whole school year. I mean, you should, you should see what those kids could come up with and their slides were so good looking uh, and full of good information. But this also led us into an activity where I wanted to give our class an identity. Like I wanted a class name because I didn't want to be like the Vincent Vikings. Right. (laughs) So, so uh, we, what we found is we were looking for commonalities in all these slideshows and that really helped us get to know each other too. Cause like, okay, how are we, how is everybody similar? Oh, I see those two people. They both have puppies and they have puppies on their slides. Well, these fifth graders were animal lovers. Uh Like they pretty much everybody had some sort of animal on their slides 
But the other thing is they were they're kind of computer geeks, either mm-hmm. for video games, Minecraft, um, artwork, like they they were really into computers. Mm-hmm. So after a process of looking at logos and names and things, uh, we came to a consensus and we named our class the Pixel Paws. Um, nice. Pixels for the computers right. that we, and games that we're all into and then paws for the for the, for the animal aspect. And then uh-huh. we mocked up some logos and I remember Maddie in my class, she came up with this really cool one that had like this pixelated paw. Mm-hmm. Um, so we went with that. I, I, I mocked up, it was over Labor Day last year, mocked up some logo possibilities. And then um, like, but the, the one I showed them first there or second, actually the first one wasn't as great. The second one, like it was unanimous. So like, Nope, that's what we're going with <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> that one. And so uh, then I got my cricket out and I put this logo everywhere. It's on our website. I would, instead of calling them like Mr. Vincent's class, we, I called them the pixel paws and it was, it was a really neat experience to let them kind of uh, come together and come up with that identity, getting to know each other through the whole process. Yeah, I, so I'm looking at your at your website for it now. So so Tony put this this site for the Pixel Paws into the show notes, and it's got those uh, those essential agreements yep. are are on there, but also this logo on there. It is a cool logo. I'm a little bit jealous of you guys. I want to be in the Pixel Paws class and have that <laughs> sticker and that T-shirt and everything. That's very cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. I put that logo over. You, know, you if you would like, you can go to Amazon and type in Pixel Paws, and you can get your own Pixel Paws uh, T-shirt. Oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> but I I, I 3D printed um, keychains and necklaces, and so we, for our classroom currency system, they could earn some some pixel paws. We call them tickets or coins, yeah. and then they could exchange those for different kinds of uh, things, yeah, including stickers. How cool, man! You put a lot of work into this. That's a lot of work, but very cool. I, I, I can imagine the students not only like loving it, like just having a blast with it, um, but just feeling so like having a different sense of belonging and ownership in the class because of it. Did you did you feel that way? Oh yeah, I interviewing the, the kids at the end of the school year. Like they they were just like. It, is the thing that they're going to remember. Oh yeah. Um, and, and one of them had even said, you know, I just felt like I was really part of something this year because yeah. of having this collective identity. You're right. And so you've got, and so you've got these kids that years from now are going to bump into each other in the hallway in high school. And they're going to remember, like we were both pixel paws. Like they might not remember if they had the same <laughs> third or fourth or sixth grade class together, but they're going to remember in fifth grade, we were pixel paws. Remember why we were, we were pixel we were. paws? Oh yeah, we all liked computers. Remember we paws? Oh yeah, we all liked animals. Remember that logo? Remember how you know the, the, the vinyl cutter and remember the three D printer? Like they they're gonna that that's that's staying with them for sure. Yeah, I remember one time I was uh, looking in, inside of a a lock. Actually, the door wasn't closed all the way in one of my students' lockers, and she had this little whiteboard, and then she had drawn uh, the pixel paws logo herself <laughs> and oh. said, "I love pixel paws." Oh, heart. and then your heart melted on that one, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then one one story that, that goes with it too, since you know I'm just obsessed with my cricket, I I can also get a like iron on vinyl. Mm-hmm. So the cricket will cut out something from vinyl and then you have to remove the parts you don't want in there after it's mm-hmm. cut, but then you can iron it onto something. So nice. as an end of the year gift, I um I put the logo on one side and then their name in the pixel font on the other. Oh, and, cool. Uh, on Amazon, I got these things. They're like, I think it's 12 for $10, these little pencil pouches, but they just come in multicolor packs. Uh-huh. So I had, I had a problem <laughs> because right. I wanted it to be a surprise, but <laughs> there's only so many of each color. <laughs> right, right. And um, luckily at the beginning of the school year, I had the, my students fill out a form so I could get to know them, a Google form. Oh, do you ask them what there, their favorite color was? <laughs> Not just their fir- their first, second, and third favorite colors, <laughs> and I'm not exactly sure what it, why? why I did that, right. but I just did, and then it came in handy because some people, I think I got first or second, but maybe I had to get a third color for others. <laughs> but um, they had forgotten that they had done that. So when I was passing them out on the last day of school, like Aiden's, like, oh, I hope I get yellow. I hope I get yellow, and then she got yellow, and then right. like, I want green. I want green. He got green. And All right. One of them blurted out, Mr. Vincent, how did you know all of our favorite colors? <laughs> they said, well, I've spent 180 some days with you. Of course, I know your favorite color by now. <laughs> I've just been watching you very carefully. <laughs> I think you sound a little bit creepy there, Tony. You know your whole class. Yeah, little, <laughs> they, they were impressed. I, I probably should have confessed to that uh, Google form, but I did not. 
<laughs> nice. Well, you know, and it talks about so last week or two weeks ago, uh, Stacy Roshan was on the show and she was talking about how when you ask kids questions, when you do some kind of thing where you like a, like a flip grid or whatever it might be, or some kind of polling, you know, you better use that for something. The kids need to see you using that. So, man, your kids really saw you using that question about their favorite colors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you just don't know what what will come in handy. And that's like, oh, yeah, I got that spreadsheet. Let's go back to August. Aha, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> So branding is something that I'm starting a little bit to hear people talking about for their classrooms and for their schools, but but it's not a big topic of discussion out there. So I recommend people check out this site that you've got here. It's pixelpause.us just to see um, kind of the idea of why brand, what it might look like to brand and what comes out of it. And they could hear by hearing your stories about it, why it's important. But I, I like how you did something that teachers typically do, which is do some kind of getting to know you activity. But the, then you took that getting to know you activity and combined it with this idea of branding so that you were really branding based on, you know, that input that they had given you. So not only do you know your kids well through it and they know each other well, but now you're then kind of pivoting that into another thing w- with this uh, with this branding. Yeah, it was it was an amazing experience. And you know, I, I had been away from classroom teaching for 12 years. So I just mm-hmm. been collecting ideas and nice. always thinking, okay, one day when I go back into the classroom, this is the way I want to do it. And, and having this class name and logo was at the top of my list like that. I knew that I wanted to give my students that kind of uh, ownership over our classroom. And, mm-hmm. and it turned out great. Yeah, very, very cool. So uh, w- one thing I want to point out here with with the original silhouette activity where you learned that information that then allowed you to to kind of develop the discussion that, that named them Pixel Paws, two, two different things in there. One is that by doing that activity of them creating the silhouette, for, first of all, how, how cool would that be? Like I'm, I'm picturing the Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock <laughs> silhouette, although hopefully none of your fifth graders look like that. Um, <laughs> no, but, but some of them did turn out very blobby. Like right. they looked at, we looked at it again at the end of the school year and it was funny. It's like, whoa, that's what I, I could do so much better. Now. I could do so much better, right? Yeah. But you're, you're building in those skills. So instead of doing some boring Google Slides lesson where they learn how to use the line tool and the arc tool and the... Uh, adding images into the slides and stuff like that. You're building that into something that has some kind of meaning to it. So that's very cool there. But the other thing here too, is that you're developing um, a set of knowledge about each kid so that if you need, if you're like struggling to connect with a kid, or if you could see a kid's, you know, not feeling well one day, you you have this bank of things that you know they like and can talk about, right? So you can go back to that slideshow and be like, oh, he likes soccer. Well, the, the you know, the World Cup is coming up. I, I could talk about that, you know, like these different things to connect with them over. I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw somebody post on Twitter recently something about, I think they were called 360 spreadsheets. Have you ever heard of a 360 spreadsheet? I haven't. What's that? Well, so it was the, the word, the number 360 was in there because they were saying they know know they know their kids all around like they know everything about their students right so this teacher has this spreadsheet where the students names are in the rows and certain things are in the columns so the things in the columns might be like interests favorite sports like you might have favorite color in there it also had some other stuff that you wouldn't gain from an activity like this like family situation or uh, parent phone number and things like that but it they then had this spreadsheet that then as they go through the year, when they need to find a way to connect with the kid, they've got all of this information in there. It'd be kind of crazy for like a high school teacher to do for their 160 students or whatever it might be. But, you know, in fifth grade, when you have whatever's looking at that picture, 22 students or whatever it might be, a kind of realistic thing, but you don't need a spreadsheet. You've got it in Google Slides all in one file. You just click right through them. Yeah, no, I did have a spreadsheet because I did have a form that I asked them to fill out uh, before they even came to school. True. I tried to know one thing about them before they even came in the door. Yeah, my memory is really bad. So you can (laughs) go back to it. (laughs) Yep. Uh, I could see myself even making a copy of that Google Slides that, that they all created and collaborated in um, for myself to kind of like take notes on almost. So, so then that area that was their silhouette activity then becomes your space to kind of take notes on kids. And maybe, maybe if a kid lists five different interests in there by putting pictures in and they put a picture of soccer in, you know, maybe once you've at some point in time mentioned their interest in soccer to them, you can kind of check it off on, on the slides where, so the kids are feeling you connecting with them, um, on all these different topics, you can go back and say, have I ever talked to like this kid loves tacos? Have I ever talked to them about tacos? I love tacos too. Right. So you've got this list of things that then you can kind of 
set goals for yourself to go back to. It'd be a lofty goal to do it for multiple classes, but, but it's, it's a goal, you know, aim for the aim for the stars. You might land on the moon kind of thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I love what you said earlier about, you know, if you ask students something, (laughs) get information from them, you better do something with it. Right. So it ties right into that. Gosh, you certainly are to have these things running on loop in the in your classroom to not only show the kids you care, but show that, hey, this thing that he asked me to do had a purpose. Like there's a reason you want to know these things. So then they're seeing it and they're hearing you talk to them about things that are that are interests. Very cool, Tony. I, I really like this stuff. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Oops. So did the pixel pause. Yeah, I believe it. So I, my alarm is going off that I've got to go pick up my kids from school, which Oof, is per- yeah. perfect timing <laughs> because we we have like we have knocked this episode out of the park and perfectly covered all of these different exciting things that you were doing in your classroom. Um, I'm so glad you were on because like what I was saying about seeing you over the summer was you went for me as a presenter from this guy who was really good at making different visuals about doing things with technology to this guy who I could hear in your voice as you spoke, your passion and knowledge about education and about working with students. And now I, I'm so glad to, to be sharing that with our listeners because they're going to, I'm sure they're geeking out at home, taking notes on all these different things they're going to do right now. So thank you so much for being here, Tony. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah. My absolute pleasure. Yeah. So uh, next week for the listeners, Tony, I want you to hear this too. We will have our second hashtag edu duct tape twitter chat and during that twitter chat on wednesday the 11th i believe is that wednesday uh, at 9 30 p.m eastern standard time we'll have a half an hour chat and we're going to be talking about these exact questions that tony and i just talked about so we'll talk about some of the stuff from the beginning the little game we played and then also ask the listeners their their responses how would they communicate these classroom routines how would they help get to know students so i think we're going to hear a lot of other uh, fantastic ideas so hope everybody will join us next wednesday to reflect on what tony said and also to share their own ideas so but tony it was an absolute pleasure thank you so much for being here with me yeah thanks for having me you guys, I am just mind blown by the stuff that, that Tony shared. I want to be in the Pixel Pause class. There was so much cool stuff he shared. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope if you don't already follow him on Twitter, which you probably do, but if you don't, I hope you go do that and check out his website and, and the Pixel Pause site and all that good stuff. Links are, as always, in the show notes. Uh, but now it's time for us to hear what the duct tapers have to say. I want to start off with a submission on the educational duct tape flip grid grid from our friend Paul West at PW Tech. So last week, I was complaining I didn't have any Flipgrid uh, submissions to share on the show because there, there weren't any new ones that I hadn't shared yet. So, so Paul uh, promptly got on and recorded this for us. Man, we let you down, Jake. I can't believe nobody had posted on the Flipgrid. I know I've been waiting to do it. And by golly, as soon as I heard the end of episode two for season two, I came straight home, got on my laptop, and I'm recording this now because... There's just way too much good stuff in that episode to not want to discuss it. I can't believe that how enthralled I was at a grown man um, playing a board game with his children. Uh, as as you piece that whole metaphor together with shoots and ladders, just awesome stuff. And I, yeah, great stuff. And I, again, I can't believe we let you down. Come on, duct tapers. We can do better than this. Season two, show up, be strong. All right. Again, thanks for all the awesome uh, learning and entertainment with the podcast. Keep it up. <laughs> I hope Paul didn't really feel bad there. Um, but seriously, guys, get out there on the Flipgrid. Go to eduducttape.com and click on the Flipgrid link or go to flipgrid.com slash eduducttape. Either one will get you there. And you could share some some uh, responses to the show or some thoughts or some laughs or something like that that I'll then stick into the end of the show here. We got another one we're going to share in a little bit because Paul was one of three people who jumped right on and shared. So one of them save until the next episode and one more we'll stick in here today. But before we get to that other Flipgrid submission. Let's talk about some of the other, uh, you know, stuff coming from the duct tapers out there. First off, an Apple podcast review coming from our friend Ann Cannon. That's at AE Cannon FS. She titled her review Educational PD You Could Use Now. And she said, I have a list of podcasts I listen to each week to grab ideas and keep up to date in the world of education and ed tech. Educational duct tape is top notch and by far shares the most useful, current, and user friendly content for all areas and grade levels. 
Thank you for sharing and creating this community of learning and adjacent possible opportunities. And thank you from me for that review and for being part of that community of learning and being part of our adjacent possible. For those of you who didn't listen to season one, first of all, get on that. But back in season one, we talked about adjacent possible a couple of times. And it's the theory that everything that we do, everything that's nearby us, all of our experiences open up and unlock other possibilities that weren't there before. They're adjacent to us. They're right there waiting for us to unlock them by accessing the things there. So by Anne joining this community, she is tapping into the adjacent possibility of everybody else out there. And Anne, thank you so much for that review. How about hashtag edu duct tape Twitter? Well, this was a difficult week for me to find stuff from from Twitter to share because there were like like 200 tweets out there because of the Twitter chat. So I ignored the ones that came from the Twitter chat. There was some fun stuff and funny stuff in there. Again, a link to, you know, my curious list of what happened in that chat is in the show notes. You can go see all of those. So I, I looked instead at some tweets that were not part of that chat that, that did make me laugh normally. And so first up, we've got at reset edu, which is Jennifer Liebens. And Jennifer, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Uh, her Google Innovator project is reset edu. You should check it out. There's a link to this tweet in the show notes. And then you could jump from that to their Twitter profile and from to the web page and learn all about reset edu. But she said, Jake Miller at Jake Miller Tech is even corny than me with all his voices on the hashtag edu duct tape podcast but you can't help but like him and his show regardless (laughs) oh thanks (laughs) i think (laughs) i do have maybe a little bit too much fun with the voices that i do on this show maybe maybe i'm pushing it too far Next is at Engage Educate. Laura said, how should I stay awake late enough for at Jake Miller Tech's new hashtag EDU duct tape chat starting after my normal bedtime? So I retweeted this for Laura. We, we received a, a series of suggestions for how she should handle that. I think I think somebody else suggested maybe, maybe it was Laura, suggested maybe holding their eye but eyelids open with toothpicks. I, I don't know if I'd recommend that. But Laura, you don't have to worry about it. You could just look at the tweets the next day and respond the next day. You don't have to participate live. Of course, the best way to do it is to participate live, but if it doesn't work out to you, you could participate late. Uh, on a similar note, at Hartel30, John said, I'm sure Soapbox and High Horse will join in on the chat, so you won't be alone alone. Hope to join in, too, even if some robo-tweets via tweet deck. Excited for hashtag EDU duct tape now on Twitter. Could a Betamax release be next? <laughs> John, I, I don't think a Betamax is coming out, but you never know. I won't. I won't completely rule it out. Uh, but John does uh, put on a good, a good uh, point there that you can schedule tweets using either TweetDeck or Hootsuite. There might be some other tools out there. I think TweetDeck is the easiest to use, most user friendly. I, I, I do use Hootsuite as well, uh, but that is an option if you feel like either you can't keep up with the tweets during the chat and you want to be able to schedule your tweets so that you could reply to other ones, or if you just aren't planning on being awake, but you want to share during the live uh, chat, that's that's an option too, for sure. Next up, at Reading in 6th, our friend Melissa said, finally able to begin listening to at Jake Miller Tech in the hashtag EDU duct tape podcast today. First post of the season was my birthday and my tweet shared first. What an amazing belated birthday gift today. Happy birthday, Melissa. I'm glad I was able to share uh a tweet from you on a previous episode on your birthday. I, I totally planned that out. That was that was completely intentional, Melissa. I knew it was your birthday, and so I scheduled that to happen on your birthday. And but uh, Melissa also shared. And this is the main reason I'm going to share this. Is that P.S. Look what I hung up this year, Jake. And you got to look at the the tweet in the show notes to see Melissa sign. She hung up in her room. It is a quote from back in season one, not a goofy quote, uh, a quote that I'm pretty darn proud of. So you have to look at that show notes uh, link to see what she tweeted. And our final tweet of the week comes from at Mo underscore physics mike muhammad friend of the show and the upcoming guest on the show and after i tweeted about him being a guest on the show he said still a little bummed i didn't get to ride the high horse i blame myself for not having my ladder handy hashtag edu duct tape yeah most show guests uh do ask to take a ride on the high horse mike i i, I was surprised you didn't ask um but yeah, you should have brought your ladder and, and been all ready to go. I would have would have definitely encouraged you to take a ride on the high horse. He did he did sit on the soapbox while he was here though for the show. <laughs> Next up, let's talk about some of the new hashtag edu duct tape tweeters of the two weeks. I used to say of the week, but now it's two weeks because we do the show every other week. Uh, there are a lot to list, probably because of the chat, which is wonderful, wonderful news. We've got at Alyssa McElroy, at Andrea Sayuker, at Apsit, A-P-S-I-T, Jen, at Auto Magical Apps, at B Cook 92. Or 922 at Charity Dodd at Coach Holly T at D underscore D underscore Collins at Dr. T loves books at Eat Right Teach. 
I don't know if it has to be in that order or not, at tech, at tech Coach Lisa, at EDT Soapbox. That's, that's you over there, Mr. Soapbox. Well, welcome into the uh, to the Twitter community, buddy. Uh, at Edu Protocols, at Edu Tech Guys, at ePool01, at Finding Miss Z, at Ginger Pickren, at Guys Got Tech Ed, at Jen- Jenae uh, Menacucci, and, and I'm, I apologize if, if I'm butchering your name, which I'm meet in person, and you'll teach me how to say it uh, the correct way, at Jenna Gibbert, at um, Mari S. Hawkins, at McConnell H88, at I uh, My Dogon Papa, I'm not sure, at Miss Knight Sai, at Miss LWBT at Mr. Underscore Brilla at Mr. Dairy Berry at Mr. Santama at Mrs. Turner underscore first at NASD Tech Coach at Nina Massion at P. Nabby at Rach Bath at S. Sadoff SH and a bunch of numbers at Smitty Gets Techie at Stacy Ford 77 at Technically Tina at Tech Warrior KES at Tuneful Techie at T X E D M O D at Winland underscore S A H S H S. So man, that's a lot of names. I'm butchering them at the end there. By the way, I, I think a lot of people have been talking about this as this school year started about out how we need to learn our students' names and say them correctly. And so I feel horrible that I'm saying some of your names correctly. And I promise if I ever meet you in person, I'm going to learn how to say your names correctly. And when you tweet in, I'm going to nail it on the show. But reading from your Twitter handles can be a little bit difficult. <laughs> and finally, let's wrap it up with one last submission from the educational duct tape flip grid grid. Here's our friend Jennifer L. Hey there, this is at J. Ellison 23 from California. Hey there. Um, I was thinking about today's episode when you were talking about the shoots and ladders and how it really emphasizes that teaching itself is actually the design thinking process. Um, so you plan something out, you attempt it, and then you reassess whether you need to, what you need to do to make it more effective and improve. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that feedback and for listening to the show. I, I do appreciate the positive words about uh, previous episode soapbox moment about uh, playing shoots and ladders with my sons. And I agree, uh, totally design thinking that that's what educators are really at our best. If we're if we're doing our best work, we are being design thinkers in the way we prepare our lessons. You know, and and not only using design thinking in the classroom and using universal design for learning and things like that, but actually being design thinkers as we plan out what we're doing with our students. I, I love that reflection. Jen, that's perfect. Uh, that wraps up episode 26 of the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Thank you again to Tony Vincent for being on the show, for Tony Jackson for allowing us to use uh, that that speech and his his words uh, in the soapbox moment from today. Please do mark on your calendars September 11th at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to either participate in the hashtag EDU Duct Tape Twitter chat or to look back the next morning to reflect on those things that are in there. A reminder that there's a link to a calendar in the show notes that you could use to put those all onto your calendar. A reminder to give the show a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform that has reviews as an option. I would love to read your review on the show, but I'm also just happy just to have your star ratings as well. A reminder to head over to flipgrid.com slash edu duct tape to add some audio that can show up in the show. A reminder to tweet or Instagram at hashtag edu duct tape and tell your friends I'd love to have new duct tapers added to our legions. Legions? Are there really legions? I don't think there are legions uh, to our community of duct tapers who are listening in. Uh, and also, as always, uh, you could uh, find out information for me as a speaker at jakemiller.net slash speaking. You could subscribe to my newsletter and get reminders about podcast episodes and things like that at jakemiller.net slash newsletter. And I'd like to close out once again with Tony Jackson's words. I am not the best teacher in the world, and I won't claim to be something I've never been, but I can say with absolute certainty that every year I am the best teacher that I've ever been. I have never been more certain. I see what doesn't work and put the work in to get it working. I'm not perfect, but still it's worth it to change what's beyond the surface. But what if I never changed? Thank you again for that, Tony. Thank you guys for listening. Have a great week. I hope to see you next week in the chitter chat. Chitter chat. Chitter chat. I hope to see you next week in the chitter chat. (laughs) Oh, goodness. And I hope to see you in two weeks for our next episode when our guest is Marsha Kish. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you later. Thank you for listening to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Please visit eduducttape.com to join the discussion, share possible topics, 
inquire about being a guest, or contact Jake. And remember, duct is spelled with a T, not a quack quack cake.